My title at the University of San Diego is Outreach Coordinator for the Sciences and Teaching Professor. So as Outreach Coordinator, that part's easy. I get to go out into the community and bring my students and we go do science with K through 12 kids around the county. In fact, I just came from Montgomery Middle School. We run an after school science program there. As uh, the teaching professor, my role is to teach science students genetics, other classes as well, but mostly genetics. And some time ago, I realized that the teaching, the what, was pretty straightforward. What is DNA? What is a gene? How are genes turned on and off? All of the stuff that's in the textbook. The why is a little bit harder to come by. Why do we need to know this stuff? So it was about 2008, 2009, I was watching the news, flipping through you know, channels, and I heard this story about a lawsuit involving the BRCA1 gene. So many of you know that's the breast cancer gene. A group of patients and researchers were suing Myriad Genetics about their their, uh, their patent, they had a patent at that time on the BRCA1 gene. So I took that story to my class the next day and I saw my students, their body language actually changed. They sat up a little taller, they looked like they were paying attention a little bit more. And I thought, wow, okay. And sure enough, two, three years later, a student that had actually graduated stopped back by my office, popped her head in the door and said, hey, Dr. Vard, I just wanna let you know I'm still following the BRCA1 story. It looks like the Supreme Court is gonna take it up. So that was really affirming for me that teaching the why is as important as teaching the what. And tonight is all about the why. We're not really going to talk much about the what, the genetic technologies like whole genome sequencing and gene chips that make it possible to analyze a person's genome uh, rapidly and, and cheaply. We're really going to focus on the why. Why do you need to know about this stuff? Why do you need to know about genetic privacy? And my goal for you all as audience members is, is twofold. First of all, that it will help Put your antenna up for, for future stories about this material that you may see in the news. This technology is rapidly changing, which means the applications for it are rapidly changing. The goalposts keep getting moved. So it's really, it really requires some attention to stay on top of it. And my second goal is that if you haven't already, that you begin to formulate your own opinion about genetic privacy. How do you feel about your own genetic information? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. Rational, reasonable people will uh, come to different conclusions. So one of the ways that we're gonna be getting to that is by discussion through some case studies. And my goal in writing these case studies was to give you some things to think about as you formulate your own opinion about this material. So let's get started. Um, so as many of you are aware, it's not just genetic information we need to worry about being tracked. We are being followed to a, an unparalleled degree these days. Um, the data collection just goes on and on and on. How does Netflix know uh, what shows to recommend to you? How does your iPhone unlock when you put your thumbprint on or your face? How does Facebook and Instagram um, suggest people you may know? And then it turns out you actually know them. How, did, how were they able to do that? How does your navigation system in your car know where you are so when you make a wrong turn it beeps at you, no, no, wrong way. Um, how does your credit card company know if there's some sort of strange activity on your credit card because they know what your regular activity looks like. They know where you you're generally do your shopping and so if something strange happens they know um, how to alert you. How do um, ads follow you from website to website? So uh, we're being tracked. Uh, but how about genetic information? Is our genetic information being tracked in any way? So that's a you know that's kind of what this talk is all about, and it's not as straightforward as an answer as you might think. Health information that's a, a, a much more straightforward answer. We have very clear and distinct laws that are designed to protect our health information. So HIPAA um, is of course the most famous, and you all have signed all sorts of forms every time you go to the doctor you know, allowing for them to disclose your information to family members, for example. So that law was passed in 1996, and, and you can see what it was designed to do. But not all genetic information is necessarily health information. If you have a genetic test done in a doctor's office in that setting, then it would fall under HIPAA. But anything else outside of that setting would not necessarily be protected in that way. So that's not quite as straightforward. We do actually have one well-defined law that's intended to protect your genetic information. This is called GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And it was written in, it was passed in, in 2008. It's a federal uh, law. 
and it's meant to protect your genetic information in, in health insurance discrimination and employment discrimination. So, so it, it does cover those two bases reasonably well. A lot of it, uh, there's a lot of things obviously though that don't fall under those two umbrellas. Some states, into, including California, have passed supplemental laws that extend those protections. So California has CalGENA and so here's some other areas where um, our genetic information is protected and, and um, bans discrimination for any sort of, of genetic um, conditions that you might have. Even still, there's things that, that slip through the cracks. Um, you'll notice life insurance isn't on, that, um, isn't on that list. And even with that law being written, things are cropping up that, that don't fit nicely under GINA. So here's a really interesting case that happened. Um, these two men work for Atlas Logistics Group Retail Services, which run grocery um, warehouses. And it turns out that um, somebody was leaving fecal matter in their warehouses. Somebody was pooping in their web in their uh, warehouses. And for obvious reasons, Atlas was distressed. You don't want that around food. So they were trying to figure out who did it. And these two men worked the same shifts where the, you know, the offending matter was popping up. And so they coerced, asked the men to submit DNA samples to um, try to see if they matched what the, was left um, in the fecal matter. And the men felt like they had to or they were going to lose their job. So they, they complied and it turns out they weren't a match. Um, and they ended up suing Atlas Logistics and they won under GINA. Even though, again, that's not at all what, what GINA was written for. Um, they did win the case, but it really does speak to the fact that even when we do intentionally write laws, that it's hard to predict what is going to happen. And then there's lots of other things, like we're going to talk about tonight, for which the laws can't even be stretched to cover. So um, how might your DNA escape from your control? These are the three main areas that we're going to talk about tonight, medical settings, uh, direct to consumer genetics companies and then through surreptitious collection. So we'll get started with our first case study here. I'll go ahead and just read it and then we'll have you turn to the, the people that are nearby you and I have four questions at the bottom for you to, to take on as a group. So Anne McElroy, PhD, is a young scientist studying the increased incidence of heart disease in African Americans. As part of her research, she has amassed a freezer full of thousands of blood samples from which she has assayed cholesterol levels. Dr. McElroy receives an email from high profile geneticist Phil Leonard, PhD, asking if she would like to collaborate. He is interested in behavioral genetics and seeks to identify genes that play a role in psychiatric conditions like bipolar disorder and susceptibility to PTSD. Specifically, Dr. Leonard would like access to the blood samples that Dr. McElroy has collected over the years. He will remove any identifying information from the blood samples, making them anonymous. All the participants in Dr. McElroy's study signed a consent form giving permission for their samples and health information to be used in heart disease research. Dr. Leonard has a good reputation in the science community and Dr. McElroy believes the blood samples will be treated appropriately if she agrees to collaborate. As a young researcher, Dr. McElroy will almost certainly benefit from any resulting publications. So as a group, I'd like you to take on those four questions at the bottom. We'll give you about 10 minutes to discuss. And then when you're, as we'll, we'll, let you, we'll give you one minute warning and we'll ask you to nominate a group member that's willing to share some of what you talked about. Okay? Well, the, uh, the main ethical question is, is that the people that gave the blood had a contract that that blood was going to be used for heart research. And so a new use of it, I think, is a substantial ex expansion of that contract. And that is a fundamental ethical issue because it's unless people are agree to a carte blanche, you need to respect those limits. Okay. I think the, the stakeholders obviously are the, the scientists, but also the, the patients who gave their, their bodily fluids and um, I think just their motivation is probably just to make sure it's not misused, that they didn't do, so, do something that's going to come back to them later. Okay, great. There's a, uh, some additional information I would like to know, so maybe some of the contractual things in terms of the, the blood specimens and the way the study was set up in the first place, but you could also inquire about what uh, 
the motivate, well, going back to the motivations of both of the, the scientists and the greater good of society, uh, there's a lot of questions that could be in there. Um, I, one of the a technical question would be, are those blood specimens even still valid for being tested for whatever uh, bipolar susceptibility and PTSD? Maybe they're not, and then Dr. Leonard needs to go get his own specimens because he needed fresh, something that was stored correctly. Another one would be the greater good of the, the society, and maybe the scientists should be willing to share, given the contractual limitations of the study in the first place. So that's some of the things we were talking about. Perfect, thank you. All right, how about this group in the corner here? Can you send someone up to answer what you think Dr. McElroy should do? Um, yeah, we were uh, discussing that uh, Dr. McElroy, it, to, the ethical thing to do would be to contact the people that she obtained the blood specimens from and tell them about the research and then refer them to the other PhD doctor and ask if the specimens could be used in their research and have him sign a contract with the people. Then you wouldn't have to worry about um, somebody complaining somewhere along the line, like, you know, if have there have something, has something been found out about that particular uh, blood specimen that they didn't want somebody to know. So I, I don't know why somebody would go and not get their own specimens if that if that's going to be a huge ethical concern. Why, why wouldn't the second researcher get his own specimens to do his own research? OK, great. Thank you. Um, OK, how about we'll take one, one more comment, and then I'll share with you what the laws actually say about um, this type of scenario. It is not at all clear how Dr. Leonard is going to get the dependent variable information. Yes. Okay. She's not collecting it. Mm -hmm. So he needs his, if I were Dr. McCullough, I'd say, well, how are you going, you know, I have no information as to their PTSD or their uh, bipolar status or anything about these kind of psychological issues. So uh, I don't understand the request. Okay. So anyway, it, so I, that's a sort of obvious problem but okay. that I didn't think about until just now. Okay. Great. All right. We are gonna, there's going to be two more case studies, so there will be time for everyone to be heard. So let's talk about some of the, or let's talk about how, what is the answer to this um, particular scenario. So there are, of course, existing federal regulations that are designed to protect people that are participating in uh, federally funded medical research, and th these are known as the the, is the common rule. And so these guidelines cover the risk to the patient and whether or not the risk has been minimized, um, informed consent standards. So this is a, what a lot of you were referring to, what exactly has been communicated to um, the patient and, and how are the researchers gonna keep the patients or the research participants information confidential? What things are in place to make sure that, that safety is being followed at all times. Um, special protections for vulnerable populations. So you noticed, uh, and, and this diversity and, and minority status is something we think about. You heard me say that the studies were collected from African Americans. So that's a, a population that historically is underrepresented in these types of studies. And as well, um, there's some dubious medical research that has been done in that group as well. Uh, and the common rule also covers the formation of institutional review boards. So these are groups at the research sites that evaluate these types of studies, and it's their job to make sure that all of the ethical standards that you were bringing up were being followed and, and following federal regulations. So the IRB considers things like uh, how sensitive is the information that's being collected, and you heard this, Dr. Leonard wanted to know about PTSD and wanted to know about psychiatric disorders, so that is something that would probably be considered particularly um, sensitive. How is the information protected once it's have been collected? Is the information made anonymous whenever possible? 
and do the informed consent documents adequately convey precautions that will be taken to protect the confidentiality of the data and as well convey what other parties beyond the researcher who has collected the blood, for example, um, will have access to that data. So w the important part to consider, though, is the confident uh, is the human subjects piece of it. So then we really need to dig into well, what is a human subject? Well, the first you know the first part is easy. It's a person, a living individual about whom an investigator conducts research. But if we dig into the bullet points a little bit um, more closely. Uh, the second bullet point obtains, uses, studies, analyzes, or generates identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens. So they don't actually have to be people. It can be tissue that's been taken from people. It can be information that has been taken from a person that's no longer connected, that's not on the person's person anymore. But we treat that as human subjects uh, unless, and this is the important part, that, that it's not identifiable anymore. So if you remove all of the, uh, and, and HIPAA and, and the common rule has different rules associated with what makes something identifiable or not, but you know, name, social security number, birthday, all of those things that you would normally be able to take that specimen and tie it back to the person that it came from makes it identifiable. So if you have removed all of that stuff, the tissue is no longer considered identifiable and therefore it's no longer a human subject. So uh, the case study that I gave you, Dr. Leonard said, I'm going to de-identify the blood. It then doesn't fall quite so cleanly under human subjects research. So it becomes much more gray whether or not Dr. McElroy needs to reach out and reconsent um, the people that donated in the first place. So just to, and this is taken from the Health and Human Services website. So here's the scenario, tissue biopsy, and this you know, how many of us have tissue that's sitting around in a freezer somewhere? Many of us do. A tissue biopsy was obtained for clinical diagnostic purposes, which have now been satisfied. The hospital pathology department is willing to provide a portion of the remaining biopsy specimen to an investigator who will perform research assays with no clinical relevance. If the specimen is coded and identifying information is removed so that the identity of the patient cannot be readily ascertained by the investigator before it is provided to them, so that it is de-identified for the purposes of HIPAA, is the investigator conducting human subjects research under the purview of an IRB? Response, human health and services common rule issues? No, this is not research involving human subjects because the recipient investigator will not be able to readily ascertain the identity of patients from whom the specimens were obtained. So again, getting back to our case study, the one thing that would, that would perhaps bring this a question about it. So clearly it's no longer considered biospecimens. He did, or, or Dr. McElroy's original consent form did say though, uh, heart disease research. It didn't say only heart disease research. If it said only heart disease research, then it would very clearly know you need to recontact those people. But the fact that she didn't say only, and the fact that the blood samples are going to be de-identified uh, means that, that they could probably go ahead without recontacting everyone, depending on what the IRB for the, the institute that they're at, depending on what their particular institutional review board came up with, but there's a, certainly more than a reasonable chance that they would say, it's okay, you can share um, the blood samples. Now, this is something that has given bioethicist pause, this idea that you can do what's called secondary research on biospecimen that have been donated for a, a singular purpose and then as long as the identifying information has been removed, used for a different purpose. That, that, that's raised some concern. So back in, in 2015, there was discussion about revising the common rule and one of the main revisions that that was being proposed was to this rule. So the NPRM is the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, proposed to expand the definition of, of definition of human subject to cover research with non-identified biospecimen. Under this expansion, informed consent would have been required for any use of biospecimens regardless of identifiability. So that was what Health and Human Services was proposing. We want to not have this, we we'll call it a loophole anymore, that if you want to use tissue, you need to contact the person that it came from. Well, the research community went bananas because, you know, someone brought up, why don't we just, why don't you just call those thousands of people? That's a big deal. I mean, how often do you pick up the phone when it rings? How often do you open emails from random 
places. I don't recognize that. It's spam. I'm not going to open it. It's actually really difficult. Why don't you get your own blood samples? It's not easy to get 2,000 people to show up and have uh, blood samples taken. So. Uh, of those that commented about that particular rule, uh, or of those that commented on the proposed changes, 50% of the comments, so you could go on the Health and Human Services website and was open for um, a year or so and, and leave your comment, 50% of the comments of all of the changes they were proposing had to do with this. And of the 50, 80% of those said, don't do this. It's going to be, um, it's going to really limit ability to do research. So it didn't happen. But the part of the reason that this conversation was even happening in the first place is not just about losing control of our tissues in research settings, it's the acknowledgement that genetics, the genetic genomic era is here and tissue contains DNA. So any tissue, even if it wasn't originally collected for the purpose of extracting DNA, could have DNA taken from it and, and potentially re-identify somebody from that tissue. So. Uh, so still, as of now, the, it pretty much stands the way uh, that I, I just said, that, that we, you still don't need to reconsent for use of, um, of secondary use of biospecimen if the um, identifiers have been taken away. But they have acknowledged that things like whole genome sequencing is making this a little bit squishier, and they're sort of agreeing to, to revisit this issue a little bit more uh, frequently. And a lot of what you brought up in our discussion, the informed consent rules, this is something else that got taken up in this um, revised common rule, th to be more explicit. So informed consent starting in 2019, so if you are participating in a research study now that, that didn't get started before 2019, you will be told whether or not it's a possibility that your tissue could be used in the future if it was de-identified uh, de and that would be without additional consent. And then there's this new thing called broad consent where a researcher could say heart disease and blank, 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 which might be possibilities for future, but then need to specify how long the tissue would be, stamp, would be stored for and so on. So it's not just wide open, but it's wider open um, than it used to be. And then a statement if it's possible that any biospecimen could undergo whole genome sequencing. So should you worry? Is this something that, that you need to worry about? If you're talking about in a research setting and you're talking about reputable scientists, the likelihood of somebody taking your mole that you had your dermatologist you know, remove and then extracting DNA from it and doing something wild with it is, is slim to none. So in that, I, I don't think you do need to worry. Uh, if you're donating to projects like All of Us, which is the um, precision medicine initiative that was started by the Obama administration. Their goal is to collect data from a million people, a million genomes, um, along with their identifying health information to try to begin to understand the ties between, um, between genetic markers that we don't fully understand and the diseases that ultimately occur. I mean, this is vital information. But that, if you're giving your genome and it's ending up on databases, they're putting a lot of protections in place. But that would be something that would give me a, a bit more um, pause than just, again, your uh, blood sample that's been sitting in your doctor's office for, for some period of time. All right, second case study. So uh, Jen Ryan, age 56, is an amateur genealogist. She is planning to surprise her brother Ben, also a genealogy enthusiast, with an extended family tree for his 50th birthday. She asked Ben's son Cooper to do 23andMe and share the ancestry results with her. She and Ben have already done Ancestry.com, but she didn't want the company to accidentally send Ben an email about a new relative on the site. When Cooper registered, it would ruin the surprise, so she steered him towards 23andMe. A few weeks later, an email arrives from Cooper with his results. While working on the family tree, Jen compares the results with Ben's and her heart sinks. Based on the Y chromosome sequence results, Ben could not be Cooper's father. <laughs> ben and Jen are very close, and she is certain that he would have told her if he and his wife, Carol, had any fertility issues and used a sperm donor to conceive Cooper. The only reasonable explanation is that Carol had an affair many years ago and got pregnant with Cooper. So what is the main ethical question? <laughs> Who are the stakeholders and what are their main motivations or concerns? Is there any additional information you'd like to know? And what, if anything, should Jen do? All right, you have 10 minutes. OK, uh, we think that the ethical question is, um, should, she, should she tell 
the son or the dad? Should she tell someone? Um, and if so, who does she tell? Or along those same lines, does she pass on the information? What does she do with this information that she's gotten? Okay, great, thank you. Main motivation for the stakeholders, I don't, it, it's hard to say whether or not by, you know, by getting uh, Cooper's um, DNA sample, she was really doing anything unethical. So that's tough. And I think a lot of the, this is a, a bit of a squishy one because so many of the issues involved are sort of personal, more than I think what would appear to be legal or ethical. Okay, the little story um, doesn't say if Carol, the mother, is still living. Say. Okay. So if she had an affair, she would know about this. The only thing would be uh, if uh, the daughter, Jen, spoke to her privately and kind of let her know this is what we had. You know, was it a sperm donor and, 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 uh, and a fertility clinic or was it something else? And uh, now she'd be part of it, of course. And then she could uh, help reach, like, you know, does she tell the father, Ben, or, or, or whatever. But I think it's okay to, to tell her, because if she really had an affair, now she knows, okay, somebody else knows. That, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so the point in me sharing this particular case study was to really point out that the, we're, we're living in this sort of brave new world and that people are, as was mentioned, sending their DNA to these companies without perhaps fully understanding the type of information that they could be getting back and what the repercussions for that might be. I mean, regardless of what Jen ultimately does with the information, she is now in possession with, of that information, is gonna have to live with that for the rest of her life, knowing that she has this, in, has this information. So. Uh, a little bit about direct-to-consumer genetics companies. So they offer the users the opportunity to learn some aspects of their health. That's a whole nother talk. How good is this information you're actually getting? Um, as well as ancestry, how good is that information? A whole nother talk. Um, but the two big main players in this arena are 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Between them, they've had about 15 million people send in their, um, send in their DNA. And there's some oftentimes confusion. They're not sequencing their whole, your whole genome. What they're doing is they're looking for variable spots in your genome that differ from, from person to person. And these are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And those, uh, through various scientific studies, some of them have been shown to be linked to various conditions or, or various ethnicities. And, and that's how they, they deliver back um, the information that you get. So this is what a, a 23andMe report might look like, and you can see that looking for things like uh, type 2 diabetes, some serious stuff, bipolar disorder, and then some silly stuff. Do you have sticky earwax or, or dry earwax? Um, but 23andMe regularly runs specials for $99. I've seen it for $79. Um, so how are they making money? It almost certainly costs them more to process that and to to send back your send back your information. So what's their business model? Um, so their business model all along has been to collect data and to sell it to whoever wants to buy it, and that has turned out to be pharma companies. So uh, last year, 23andMe announced a big partnership with uh, GlaxoSmithKline, $300 million uh, partnership for for drug development. So. What exactly, though, is 23andMe selling when they say they're selling your data? So unless you've given explicit consent, what they're selling is called aggregate data. So again, back to this de-identifying thing. They take away all your name, your phone number, anything that could readily tie you to your SNPs, and then they bundle it up with a whole bunch of other people's SNPs and they sell that. And so the type of data they're selling is 30% of people with this SNP have this disease. And you might be in that pool because you filled out a survey as well. So someone said, well, how valuable is this information if it's just the standalone genetic information? Well, not very, but if you also have survey data that goes along with it, I have you know, depression or whatever, and, and they have, um, I saw reported, they have about 300 data points on average per user. So they, they have a way of, of sneaking information from you. That's what they're selling, but without your name attached to it. If they want you to participate in research in a way that you remain identifiable, so they've had uh, Parkinson's initiative, they've had a lot of people that, whose families have been affected by Parkinson's, 
give their information, uh, you, they, they will contact you and say, can we do this? And, and then you give consent and, and then that information is shared. So, you know, do you need to freak out? It's, it's highly unlikely that anyone would be able to find you from aggregate data, but you may not feel very good about the fact that you've paid 23andMe to then make money on your information, and in a way that they weren't really straightforward about it. You really have to dig into their terms of service to find out that, that this is, in fact, um, what they're doing. But it doesn't stop there. So uh, some people that do 23andMe or Ancestry.com in particular are really interested in Ancestry and trying to find relatives. But, and both services have ways for you to do that. But you can only contact people that have also done 23andMe if that's what you've done or Ancestry.com if that's what you've done. GEDmatch was started in 2010 as a nonprofit public database where people can download their raw SNP data from 23andMe or Ancestry and put it on this publicly searchable database so that anybody that is interested in genealogy, that was the intention, could um, find you. And the, you can, so here's an actual screenshot of what the GEDmatch homepage looks like. It's very stripped down. This is not for profit. These are two guys that were just interested in genealogy and in particular wanted to help people find biological parents, so adoptees. So um, not meant to be a money maker, not meant to really be anything that made a big splash. It was meant to be for people that are super into genealogy and just want to find um, relatives. And so as of 2018, they had um, over a million profiles. That they're called kits on their, um, on their website. So again, really stripped down, no frills. You upload your, your, your information and the two arrows that I have there, please acknowledge that you authorize this data to be made available for comparisons in our public database. So they're, you know, again, these are people, hopefully, that fully realize what they're doing. They're, they're putting their information out there for the world to see, and then can we provide your email address to your matches? So if somebody finds you, are you giving permission for them to contact you? Well, I'm sure many of you heard this story last year. Um, law enforcement used GEDmatch to catch the Golden State Killer. So uh, what happened? So this is, um, this is a serial rapist and murderer that was operating in the 70s and 80s in Northern California, accused of 13 murders and, and over 50 rapes. Uh, DNA was collected at the scene, but the way these databases work, if there's no match in the system, there's nothing you can do. So, and that was indeed the case. So at some point, someone realized, hey, we could take this DNA evidence, make a SNP profile, upload it to GEDmatch, and see if we can find any distant relatives of that person. Uh, and, and that's in fact what they did, and they were able to find some third and fourth cousins of D'Angelo was the, the name of the, the murderer. And then through old-fashioned detective work, who lived where, when, that kind of thing, who fit the profile, and they narrowed it down to him, um, and actually then went and collected some of his DNA without him knowing, and found that, that there was indeed um, a match, and, and, he was, um, and he was arrested. And since then, there have been about 50 cases that have been similarly solved. All of this happened without GEDmatch having any idea. Again, this is these are two guys that started it. I don't know if it was actually a basement, but, that, but that's the idea. This was just two guys that were trying to help out the genealogy community. So they were kind of like, holy cow, what do, what do we do now? So they decided to amend their terms of service. And I've got the little arrow there. So they're acknowledging that, law, that it, they're letting users know if you're putting your DNA up here, um, it, it could be uh, DNA obtained and authorized by law enforcement to identify a perpetrator of a violent crime against another um, individual, identify remains of a, of a deceased individual. And they're defining violent crime just below here as a homicide or sexual assault. And so that's what allowed for the 50 subsequent cases after the Golden State Killer to be solved. But then um, GEDmatch decided to bend the rules for a special case that happened in um, Utah. So there was a 71-year-old woman that was at her church practicing the organ. The church was locked. And somebody broke in and, and terribly assaulted her. And she was very badly hurt. She, she survived, but she was very badly hurt. But it was a, a really egregious um, egregious act. So Utah police reached out to GEDmatch and said, can we do this? And they, they bent the rules or, or bent their terms of service and said, okay. 
and the police solved the case. They caught the they caught the person that did the assault. Uh, and the Jed Match users were not happy about that because they had been they had been told rape and, and murder, and here you are bending the rules. What else are you? When else are you going to bend them? So in response to that, um, earlier this year, Jed Match updated their terms of service to say everybody is opted out of having their profiles match with anything that law enforcement loads onto the site and that you need to opt in if you want your um, information to be available in that way. So basically overnight, the number of, of the profiles that that police could search went from you know 1.3 million or whatever it was to zero. Um, since then, uh, tens of thousands have. I think it's around 30,000, but it's still nowhere near the 1.3 million um, that that it previously was. So that avenue has basically been shut down uh, for law enforcement. There's another website, Family Tree DNA, I think, dot com that um, is, is sort of getting into this and, and maybe the new site for this type of, of work. But until, you know, it, it, as I said at the beginning, this is just such a fluid situation. Everything I just told you about happened in the course of a year. So it's one of those stay tuned and, and we'll see if GEDmatch changes, um, changes their mind. So should you worry? Is this something that you should worry about? Well, um, an interesting study came out around the time of the Golden State Killer case where researchers did some modeling and figured out that once GEDmatch reaches 3 million users, that 99% of those of us in the US of European descent, because that's what most of the profiles are that have been uploaded, um, will have at least a third cousin match. So all of us are going to be identifiable through somebody that has put uh, their uh, DNA on Jed match. So is that something to be concerned about? I, I mean, are you a criminal? So I say that lightly, though. I say that as a, uh, a highly educated white woman that lives in the suburbs. I'm not a demographic that has a history of being profiled by the police, for example. So um, other communities that have experienced uh, racism in our criminal justice system could have very different feelings about um, how very accessible this type of information is. And, and imagine there's a, you know, there's a, I don't know, an armed robbery at Starbucks and you were there, your cup's in the trash, you weren't the robber, but you know, you can imagine a scenario where, where something could, there could be a misidentification. Uh, but as of now, there's no laws um, governing this. It's um, completely legal for the police to be able to do this kind of work. All right. So in the early morning of April 2nd, 2006, 36-year-old Alicia Fleming woke in her home to a pillow being pressed over her face by a masked assailant. He blindfolded and raped her. Although DNA evidence was left at the crime scene, there were no matching profiles in the CODIS forensic database. Nearly two years later, Alicia had a flashback that led her to suspect that a former classmate, Jeffrey Reynolds, was her attacker. She notified the police, who then asked Mr. Reynolds for an interview. He went to the police station and sat for an interview, but refused to give a DNA sample. Without a warrant, the police could not compel him to comply. However, they noticed that Mr. Reynolds seemed very nervous and sweaty during the interview, rubbing his bare arms on the armrests of the chair he was sitting in. After Mr. Reynolds left, the police swabbed the chair, obtained a DNA sample, analyzed it, and made a match. Reynolds was later convicted of the rape. So what is the main ethical question? Who are the stakeholders and what are their main motivations? Is there any additional information we'd like to know? And should police continue to collect abandoned DNA without a warrant? All right, so discuss and we'll meet back. Hi. Hi. <laughs> That's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping she called me up on the last one because I was wondering who Cooper's mom is or dad is. But Cooper's our son. <laughs> so uh, the main ethical question here is, uh, is it okay for the police to take that sample uh, without a warrant or the, uh, what's his name, Jeffrey Reynolds' consent? So the main stakeholders are obviously um, Jeffrey Reynolds, uh, he does not want his DNA taken without his consent. But also, um, I teach a forensic science class, and the police are main stakeholders here. This is a very valuable tool for them to being able to identify people. And it's also the general public. You know, the, the, you want people like this to not be running around and to be caught. So 
That's, I think it's really important to think about this. It's really a difficult issue when I teach it in class. You know, the, the key concept down there of abandoned DNA, I think, is important in privacy because we have a doctrine that's in use on the Internet every day. If you voluntarily choose to not use minimum prudence to protect your privacy, you're essentially forfeiting it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in a concept here, and I would, I think that most of us would come down on the fact that this is a fair thing for the uh, police to do uh, because the the man had the opportunity to clean up the chair afterwards, and he didn't take <laughs> advantage of it. <laughs> All right, well, you actually brought up a lot of important issues. This was not, well, I guess it's a case study, but it's not one that I wrote. This is a, a, an actual case. So this is exactly what happened in um, Maryland in the um, earlier 2000s. And he was convicted of the rape and, and appealed to the Maryland, you know, sort of Supreme Court um, on the grounds that his Fourth Amendment rights were violated. So the Fourth Amendment, the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, and, and so on. So the arguments that you brought up. So Mar Maryland's arguments, why was this okay? Rayner abandoned his DNA. <laughs> DNA is like a fingerprint. No one expects fingerprints um, to be private. The chair belongs to the police department, and the police had reason to suspect Rayner. I didn't include that in the case study, but they had some other reasons to believe that he could be the rapist. Um, Rayner's arguments, a person has reasonable expectation of privacy in their genetic material, uh, and you need advanced methods to extract it, sort of unlike a, a traditional fingerprint. True abandonment is an intentional act. So to what you were saying, you leave your DNA everywhere. Even if you tried to wipe it up, you would be still leaving your, your DNA. Um, and even if the police had the right to swab the chair because it was their chair, they then had to go on and analyze it. And just the fact that it was their chair doesn't give them the subsequent right to, to analyze it. But the part that ends up being most important in how the, um, Supreme, the Maryland Supreme Court decided was this fingerprint part. DNA is like a fingerprint. Well, we know that that's not true, actually, that there's lots more information in our DNA than, than there is in a fingerprint. But the way that the police use it, it really is like a fingerprint. So all of us have these areas in our DNA that are called uh, short tandem repeats. So we all have them, and we all have the same sequences in those repeats. So like my diagram here, the sequence is A-G-A-T. Where we differ is how many copies of those repeats that we have. That's where the variability comes into play. And so if you scan enough of these different locations of the genome, uh, you get to a point where no two people will have the same number of repeats. So up until relatively recently, there were 13 spots in the genome that, that were scanned during DNA fingerprinting, and those all get put into um, a national database um, called CODIS, uh, that number of repeat, the number of sites has since been bumped up to um, 20. But again, the idea is that no two people will have the same number of repeats. And if, if all you're looking at is that, uh, then you can't know anything beyond the identity of um, the person. And there are laws that, are, that prevent law enforcement, as of now, from looking at anything besides uh, those repeat sections for identity purposes. So in 2011, um, the Court of Special Appeals of Maryland upheld the conviction in a four to three decision. So this is not, this was not an overwhelming slam dunk, yeah, the police did the right thing. And there's been similar cases in other states and they've also <coughs> been quite mixed. So this isn't something that, that our courts have felt really confident about. Um, and what their ruling came down to, though, was the fingerprint part, that, that we don't have expectations of privacy in our fingerprints, and that if all you're looking at in the DNA is these repeat regions, then it really is like a, a, a fingerprint. And in 2015, the Supreme Court, the, our, the federal Supreme Court, re refused to review the case. So this is the law of the, the land right now. So there, there have been no laws prohibiting law enforcement from collecting discarded or abandoned DNA. They can even go after it in more um, aggressive ways. So this was a case out of Seattle 
where they had a suspect for a, a rape and murder, but it was a cold case. It was 20, 30 years ago. Um, a new officer ended up opening up the cold case and decided to have a second look at this person, this man that had been the suspect, but he had moved um, out of state, was living in New Jersey now. They sent him a letter that said he was part of some sort of class action lawsuit, and if he returned this form that he might get some money, he licked the envelope. and. Uh, <laughs> was convicted, uh, wa the Washington State Supreme Court said it was okay. Again, in a, in a really close decision. But so, so there really have been no limits to date put on the police's ability to collect so-called discarded DNA. But really, that's meant to be for the purpose of catching criminals, and they've caught lots and lots of, as was said earlier, really awful people that we don't want on the street. So the part that it becomes uh, perhaps a little bit more gray, is what about you and I? Can I take your DNA and, uh, if I could, had the technology to sequence it, could I do that? Would it be okay? And, and why would I want to do something like that? Why would I want to, why would anybody want to steal someone else's DNA? What, what could you actually gain from that? Well, you can actually imagine a number of reasons. Um, political gain, we're, you know, in the middle of a, of a presidential election. Um, there were rumors that President Reagan had Alzheimer's, for example, during his last few years in um, in office. What if someone had got some of his DNA and found out he did have the genetic predisposition? And there is a, a genetic marker out there for Alzheimer's. So what if we had that information? Celebrity keepsake. You can imagine um, obsessive fans wanting that. Uh, screening potential mates or adoptive children. Could you find out if um, somebody that you were thinking about marrying and, and having kids with screen their DNA and find out if they have anything medical conditions that you might want to worry about. Paternity or genealogy testing. So there was a plot <laughs> there was a plot in England in the early 2000s. There, someone was going to try to get some of Prince Harry's DNA to prove that Prince Charles wasn't his, um, wasn't his father. And there was an actual plot. There were, it, it didn't happen, but it, it, it was stopped, but that was out there. Um, blackmail, you can imagine, a, I don't know, angry coworker, somebody who, who wants to get some dirt on you and maybe thinks that they can get some health information out of your DNA. Fact checking ethnicity claims. I don't know if you remember this woman from a few years ago, but it, she uh, identified herself as an African American woman, um, and it turned out that she wasn't. She worked for the NAACP for some period of time, and um, it turned out that, that she's not actually African American. So that uh, could have been something, though, that, that her DNA would have told us. So. Uh, you would think that would be something really easy to make illegal, that a, an average citizen cannot take another average citizen's DNA and do anything with it. Shockingly, it's not. There's very few states, only a minority of states, have laws that actually require consent to do genetic testing. And of the laws that exist, um, they're not framed around surreptitious collection. They're not framed around somebody doing what I just described, grabbing your cup after you leave the, the um, talk here tonight and doing something with your DNA. The state that has the most robust law is actually Alaska. And they do explicitly ban that type of behavior and say you have to have consent from somebody to do anything with their DNA. Um, why Alaska, though? Why is Alaska <laughs> a leader in um, protecting your, your genetic information? Well, the reason in part is because Alaska doesn't have a robust research program. So California um, had a bill in the works a few years ago that would have made surreptitious collection illegal. But the way the bill was worded, it could have been interpreted in a way that as we were talking about earlier, people that donate tissue for research might still have possession of the DNA that's contained in that tissue and that any researchers would have to reconsent or have to reach out to those people to say, can we do X, Y, and Z with your tissue? So the UC system, Stanford uh, consortium of, of hospitals came out heavily against this bill and said, if, you, you know, if, if you're really trying to make this about surreptitious collection, then make it about surreptitious collection. Be very explicit in your wording. And for whatever reason, that didn't happen, and, and the bill died. So uh, as of now, there are no laws in California that prevent, again, average citizen A taking average citizen B 
B's genetic information, putting it on the web and, and so on. Maybe there's some laws out there about stalking that, that like Gina, could be stretched to, to fit that circumstance, but there are no explicit laws um, stopping that from happening. So should you worry? Should you gather all of your you know, things that you've touched tonight before, <laughs> before leaving the room? Um, to be clear, even if somebody did take your DNA, they'd have to have some way to get it analyzed. And most of us don't have access to that type of equipment. There are companies that um, will do things like paternity testing from sheets, things that, that or, or um, infidelity testing to find out if there's you know, residue that's not supposed to be there. Um, there are companies that will do that. So, so potentially if someone was really, really motivated, they could find a way to get at least some of your um, genetic information, but, but it certainly would not be straightforward. It's not a straight line from A to B um, as far as, as things are right now. And what information, if, if that did happen and somebody did was able to sequence your whole genome, what could they really know about you? It, it's, it's less than you might think. They can tell if you're a man or a woman. If they were stealing your DNA, they probably knew that already, though. Um, your ethnicity, your blood type a limited number of diseases. And, and this is why when I mentioned at the beginning, um, programs like all of us, when we're trying to get uh, millions of people to donate DNA so we can start to make those connections between genetic variation and disease, we're really good at sequencing DNA right now. That's super fast, thousand bucks, not a big deal. We're not very good at knowing what genetic variations are actually causing disease right now because most diseases are not caused by single gene mutations. Those we're, we're good at. So I've got the list up here of sickle cell, uh, Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, those things we pretty well understand. And, and if someone got your DNA, they'd be able to know if you were a carrier of, of one of those as well. When we get to the more complex diseases that are those that affect most people, the cancers, diabetes, and so on, it's not, um, the story's much more complex. It's not complex. It's not one gene, it's many genes, and it's the environment. So there's not as, as clear of a pathway there. So you might learn from your DNA some risk factors that you have, certain cancer risks. BRCA is, is our best example of that, but there aren't all that many robust markers that we can say, yes, you are definitely going to get a disease because you have X um, gene mutation. Uh, uh, some, but not as, not as many as you might think. And then also that they'd be able to find out your, your family connections if they wanted to um, through GEDmatch. So that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you.